Hi, this is Lex, and welcome to the Fintech Blueprint. It's your podcast about fintech, decentralized finance, digital banking, investing, robo-advice, artificial intelligence, and all the other frontier technology that is transforming financial services. To get more content, like an illustrated transcript of this conversation in your inbox, subscribe at fintechblueprint.com. So without further delay, let's jump into today's episode. Hi, everybody, and welcome to today's conversation. I'm absolutely thrilled to have with us today Stan Maroshnik, who is the founder and managing partner of 10 Squared Capital. He's also got a fantastic set of experiences across capital markets in digital assets and crypto, as well as in traditional finance. So I'm really excited to have this conversation and welcome Stan to the podcast. Lex, it's a great pleasure to be here. Long time listener, first time caller. Wonderful to have you. That's the best kind. We're already prepared for anything I'm going to throw at you. You know that we're going to start out with your early foundational experiences for your career. What pulled you into financial services and you know what were some of the early things that you've done? Yeah, so I, I started my career at Morgan Stanley and I focused on financial institutions, so banks, thrifts, insurance companies, specialty finance, mortgages, and spent five years working across capital markets and M&A, you know, kind of really getting to know that sector, looking at kind of the emergence, this is early 2000s, of, of fintech. Back then, fintech was basically PayPal and E-Trade. Those were kind of my early formative, but also ossifying experiences in thinking about financial services and where, you know, the, the nature of money is going. This is probably rooted in my kind of earlier childhood experiences. I grew up in, in the Soviet Union and in what is now Ukraine, but I was, I was born in, and spent the first part of my childhood in, in Kiev. And I, I just remember some vivid experiences in kind of the late Soviet Union stage before we left for the U.S. and the challenges that people had with, with hyperinflation, with, with the policies that the government imposed on on people and trying to control the economy and failing. And so it's it's always sort of something that's been in the back of my mind as I thought about money in general, about financial services, about monetary policy, and, and about kind of people's relationship to money. I'll, I'll share an anecdote. So one of my early, like most vivid childhood experiences is being very young and my my, my mother giving me a large kind of wad of cash to take to a relative. And, you know, I was, I was kind of 11 at this time. And I was this kid that's carrying this very, very large sum of money, like several cars worth of cash across town on a tram, because the government, the night before announced these massive reforms, basically a demonetization that confiscated a lot of value from from the people. They basically canceled the 50 and the 100 ruble notes. And so anyone who had an excess amount of cash on hand, which is pretty much everybody, because people didn't trust the state savings banks, were out of luck. They couldn't convert that money. We, we saw this recently, you know, in roughly in 2016 in India as well. So this, this was a very punitive policy. And so I remember as a kid carrying this giant wad of cash across town. And so as I kind of form my view of money and eventually as I discovered Bitcoin, thinking about sort of self-sovereignty and being in, in, in control of your property, that was kind of a big, big thing I reflected on. Yeah, I mean, that's a wild story, right? Like think about transaction costs of sending money, you know, Americans, of which many post-Soviet people are part of the class, you know, and myself. Americans think, oh no, I have to pay a hundred dollars for a wire and there is like an effects fee, there's a hidden three percent charge. When I send this ten thousand dollars to whatever it is, Mexico or the UK or Eastern Europe or Asia, whatever, I'm gonna lose five hundred dollars on this ten thousand dollar transfer. In your case, the friction, the transaction cost of the money transfer is literally your child, you know, like the safety of your child. And I think for for many people who've grown up with really stable financial systems, like this, you take for granted that you have economic stability and legal stability. They don't realize just how much of a benefit a functional financial system 
is, especially in a place that that doesn't have the infrastructure or the DNA to do that in an honest, you know, open way in the way that the Eastern European bloc had to go through. I mean, I also remember the time where there just wasn't capitalism other than in the gray markets. And so you really couldn't use the fiat currency. You couldn't really use the ruble to store any wealth or any savings at all. During 92 and then 94, I remember hyperinflation, you know, going to the store and buying a piece of bread and, and some some chicken, and it would be 50 rubles and then 500 rubles and then 5,000 rubles. And my parents were getting paid one month and not getting paid another month because the companies they were working for were state run and the budgets ran out. And so I think they look at the crypto space as this kind of crypto anarchist, hyper capitalist thing separate from reality. But I think for many people, it is it is a panacea for the absence of, of real capitalism and real capital markets. Can you talk to us about your work in the capital markets and investment banking? Like, what were you focused on and what was that experience like? And, and I completely agree with you that most of us take, you know, property rights, due process, rule of law for granted. And, and I think for, you know, a functional financial system, that, that is absolutely a must. And most people don't, you know, in the world don't have that. They, they live with the fear of their assets being confiscated or, you know, being at at the whim of either the government or an authority or, or thugs. And so, you know, we'll, we'll get to this, but I think digital assets solve a lot of those problems and, and, and empower people. But going back to financial services, my, you know, my, my early professional experiences are working with, around working with regulated financial institutions and really understanding how banks and how thrifts work, what, what drives, what, what are the regulatory levers, what are the capital levers, how to think about risk weighted assets, what are the you know the the business models of these financial institutions. And that as technology came into financial services, thinking about payments and remittances, how to remove the friction, how to lower fees, how how to fight f- fraud and beginning to deal with online customers. I spent a lot of time do, doing capital markets work. So that's issuing securities, bonds, convertible notes, trust preferreds, equity, and also doing merger and acquisition work. So helping financial institutions invest, divest, merge, acquire other banks, other institutions, new business lines. And so that was the first part of my career at Morgan Stanley. Eventually they, 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 they figured out that I speak Russian and then they put me on a bus to Moscow. And so the Moscow practice from Morgan Stanley was just spinning up. This was on the investment banking side, and this was just as the popular BRICS thesis was developing in the early 2000s. And so Russia became a big part of the emerging markets story globally, and many Russian companies started to go public on the London Stock Exchange and other Western markets. And so there was a big boom and need for those investment banking services to help these companies come to market, to help place the shares, and really shape the companies and their governance into what is acceptable and palatable for Western investor audience. And so that was kind of a very unique experience, you know, being a young professional, but working with very senior folks, you know, CEOs, CFOs at companies, working with their element ministries, working with other stakeholders to, you know, shape the companies and craft the, the equity story to take them to market. So those were very interesting times. And so I I spent a large part of that time focused on natural resources because, you know, that's what Russia is known for. Those are the companies that were in demand and and going public. And so, you know, a a large part of my career was also focused on the natural resources sector, particularly oil and gas. And I ended up running that practice for for Morgan Stanley in the region. And and so that kind of brought me into a corporate role. So I, I left Morgan Stanley to join a large national oil company, or a large global oil company called TNKBP to run their strategy and mergers and acquisitions. And so that was a really interesting experience of really thinking from an owner's perspective of, you know, what are our capabilities? What are the, what are the things that we want to build what, what are we best in the world at and what you know what what makes sense strategically and so i ended up helping sell that business to the russian national oil company to rosneft after a few years and then returned to the us and refocused on on fintech and by that time 
you know, there's a, a, an explosion of fintech from from online banking to online lending to payments, and this was you know roughly around you know, 2013, and so just the emergence of digital assets and Bitcoin, kind of for the first time having that meaningful appreciation of value and, and first coming into public consciousness in a small way. Before we get to Bitcoin, I want to ask more about your experience in the Russian markets, in particular around just watching a capital market grow up, like be summoned into existence because it was necessary and because all of these enterprises, you know, appeared and started generating revenue. And I think there's a lot of analogies we can make, but the natural resources in the country and the financial ties to all over the world through that and the supply chains that, that were being built and the opening of the economy. What were some of the patterns of a new capital market coming into place? And what takeaways do you have for that, for that early period as capital flowed in? Yeah, I mean, I, I think you initially had you know, this period of capital formation, this sort of land grab in the post-Soviet years where, you know, institutions, state institutions were were privatized and you had all of this, all of these resources and assets flowing to few concentrated hands, those that were able to gather, you know, resources and and even muscle early. And so you had this very high concentration of, of companies, resources and capabilities in, you know, a dozen hands. And so, you you know, these, these people kind of became known as oligarchs, but they controlled large swaths of Russian economy that the state didn't control. And so, you know, it began to have political overtones as these folks all kind of gathered, not just economic but uh, power, but also, you know, political power, influence, etc. And so, you know, this, this influx of wealth then drove, you know, the, this kind of in-part economy where you know, Western goods, Western values, Western luxury items were, you know, poured into Moscow, poured into the rest of the country. And so it kind of changed, you know, people's kind of perception and and really introduces entrepreneurial dynamic, right? So those those that grew up in the Soviet state were, I feel like, were, were not by nature entrepreneurial and, and driven by a capitalist system. Whereas I think, you know, the early 2000s for me are marked by you know, particularly aggressive kind of entrepreneurship and people for the first time having the economic freedom, having access to credit, having access having access to proper banking and are able to invest and build businesses. This goes from, from retail to consumer goods to, you know, services, et cetera. And so it was kind of a really fascinating time to watch capital formation, industry formation period for the country. Did you have the clean separation of like capital markets roles from the beginning? Like this is a custodian and this is a clearinghouse and this is a broker dealer and this is an exchange, you know, and this is a ratings agency and they have, this is sell side and this is buy side. And there's kind of nice walls between the businesses and this is your regulator. And that's exactly what they focus on. We know this is not the case in crypto that it's been a total mess and mushing together of these functions, but you know, for an emerging market, but where you didn't have all these roles in place. I know I'm leading the question and that they didn't spontaneously appear, but how did these roles develop over time? And was it messy? And can you talk about that? Yeah, I mean, it was it was super messy because you were trying to reconcile, you know, a, a state state plan economy with these fairly rigid banking institutions with, with wanting to deal with Western counterparties and offer shares to Western investors. And so, a lot of financial technology had essentially had to be reinvented and made com- sort of backwards compatible with, you know, Russian accounting standards, the the way that banks, you know, a- accounted for currency, the, the way they lent to each other overnight. And then you had to basically rewrite or write sort of de novo all of the regulations that are applicable to, you know, the ruble denominated exchanges, the, the custodians, the roles of the bank play, how you clear and lend each other security. So a lot of this was, you know, obviously modeled on, Western frameworks, but all of this stuff had to be reinvented. And, and a lot of it was clunky because it was working with and you know, trying to work with a legacy financial system that was not designed for any of these transactions. And a lot of it was not even digitized early. So you had a lot of paper moving around. So it, it was certainly pretty messy in its formative days on both the, the technical side and, and the regulatory side. So let's transition to the world of Bitcoin. And you were one of the earliest folks to take the 
asset class seriously and to start building a rigorous investment banking practice around it. Can you talk about how you saw the opportunity, what motivated you to do it, and then how it went? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And so, so in, in 2015, somebody sent me, a, a friend sent me a mining deal because he knew I had experience in uh, natural resources. And I, I looked at it and it turned out to be Bitcoin mining. <laughs> and, and, and so as I kind of went down the rabbit hole on, on Bitcoin, I became you know, fascinated at the cross-section of financial services opportunity and the commodities cycle nature of Bitcoin. And so I ended up building a Bitcoin mine in, in the state, state of Washington, the Columbia River Valley. It was about two megawatts, which was decent size at that time. And, and it was pretty successful. And so that was kind of my first foray into digital assets. At the same time, the Ethereum ICO was was happening. And so as I looked at the dynamics of the ICO, it was basically just any kind of emerging markets capital transaction. There was, you know, there, there was a demand for the asset. There was a nascent capital market. There was kind of a story that was being told around, you know, kind of what, what a typical kind of capital markets equity story would sound like. And, and so to me, that signaled that this is kind of a birth of a new capital market. Tokens were going to be an interesting and important frontier asset class and that and that eventually this would need to be in a regulated framework and usually intermediated by a financial institution and you know this this to me was kind of the the playbook of many of sort of the emerging investment banks in other parts of the world so like like UFG or Troik there were local leaders in in Russia you know, my mental model was, okay, you're going to need that for the digital asset space. And so with a couple of partners, I founded Argon, which was one of the early advisory and investment banks that was focused entirely on the token space. And we worked very closely with the legal teams at, at Cooley and Perkins Cooley and some of the other folks who were leading legal thinkers at the time. And we worked closely with focus, folks at Deloitte to create frameworks for compliant token offerings. Or, or at least at, at that time, as people were thinking about what is the most compliant path without having any clear, you know, regulatory guidance. And so we worked on some of the early deals, such as Civic, such as Tyrion, uh, Blockchain Capital Security Token. So it was a fascinating experience. And the dynamics were very similar in that you, you, you had kind of an order book building process. You had an equity storytelling process. You had a compliance process of creating the right tax structures, creating, you know, a compliant offering mechanism. And, and so we, we, we built a you know, pretty unique practice that I think became you know, an early leader in the space kind of around 2016, 2017. I want to talk about the complexity of compliance in 2024. It's still an open question about regulation this and regulation that, but I think in many geographies, there is now precedent, there are bills or legislation written in Europe, in the UK, in Asia, something will eventually happen in the US that's useful. In 2016, 17, you had to really invent all this for the first time. And the idea that you could have a digital asset, which could be a financial instrument that, for example, shifts over time starting out as having some aspects of a bond that creates some sort of liability on behalf of builders and then over time turns into a pseudo equity and then turns into a loyalty point at the same time. It was just nonsense to most regulators. I also remember the legal charts, the legal maps for how blockchain capital was structured, you know, and there were no less than, you know, 20,000 entities. I mean, maybe, maybe not thousand, but like at least 10 and change, you know, what was it like to engage with that process? And how did you not give up? The only salient kind of framework at the time was, was sort of thinking about the Howey test and understanding how do you not touch, touch its various prongs and then craft your process around that. And part of the solution was, okay, well, why don't we do it outside of the U S and not offer it to to U.S. residents and live outside the U.S. framework, but then you had all these kind of other issues of people using VPNs, and then you had kind of a flowback problem that even if you offer it outside of the U.S., there's a chance that it ends up in U.S. hands. And, and so we spent a lot of time with, with counsel trying to figure out what, what is kind of the best path to do this. In the case of blockchain capital, 
there was a, an offering that was structured through Singapore, and it was actually you know done as a Reg S offering at the time, meaning it was you know a registered securities offering outside of the U.S. But in in Singapore, in the local jurisdiction, you know tokens were not considered a security, and so that was kind of a, a way we found to to parse a lot to create something that could potentially be traded on exchanges, but but it was offered in a way that was, in theory, compliant with, with U.S. law. And so it was, that was probably the, the most highly structured offering. And it was, it was kind of very successful. And I think that uh, BCAP is still traded and available on Securitize. And it's, I think, one of the best performing crypto <laughs> funds you know, over the last five years. So, so, so that worked out well. But with other offerings, as we think about something like Civic or Enigma or Ripio, you know, you had to kind of think about these outside of the U.S. structures in Cayman and elsewhere, about foundation structures. And at that time, Switzerland was kind of the, the, the place to do it and, and kind of MacGyvering the scheme because there was no clear path that was drawn. And so we had these painful discussions with lawyers where the lawyers were always hedging. You know, here's our advice, but the risk you're taking is, right? So it's up to you to take the risk of whether this offering is, you know, what would, would be you know, considered a securities offering by the regulators. So, so these were lengthy and, and kind of tortured discussions on the legal side to, you know, to get these things out the door. It's such an interesting time, you know, and I want to talk about the, just the nature of what was the ICO market and how to think about it. When I read coverage of tech trends, depending on what kind of market you're in, you know, it's either a spectacular boom or a horrible bubble. There's like no in between. You, you can't have it just be like, this is innovation and, and speculation is healthy. It's always, in retrospect, that was a bubble and it was bad. You know, it was the, the internet bubble or the mortgage-backed securities, you know, bubble. And it was, oh, it's so easy to see. But in fact, I try to not use that word. I try to always say it was a boom at the time. And in retrospect, yes, it's crashed, but like price discovery was happening. And certainly a lot of people came in through speculation, but it was also really difficult to tell the difference between a high quality project and a low quality project. Like being able to tell the difference between civic or blockchain capital is not easy. Or, you know, looking at something like Gnosis and some of the other early ICOs, the Ethereum they raised, you know, is in many cases is far more valuable than has become far more valuable than whatever tokens they had ended up issuing. And they turned into a de facto holding company, asset management company, venture production studio or whatever. So I wonder about the asset class as a whole. You know, another example would be something like EOS, which raised $4 billion over 365 days to essentially have that all go away in part, although then it was reinvesting into other things. And so it's so hard to pin down what exactly the investments were and how they performed. How do you think about the asset class at that moment of time? Because I think it was quite unique and hard to get your mind around. I think one way to think about it is kind of liquid venture in a sense that you were investing in very early technology, you know, protocols, applications, ideas, right? And, and, and so, and, and it was, it was, you know, for the for the first time available to the public, right? So the, it was kind of in the post angel list era, but this is the first time the you know the the public was able to invest directly into so in, in into projects that they thought had kind of high convexity that, that were going to be very large, very successful. Were going to have these disproportionate outcomes, and it was venture that was married to an emerging capital market. So so you invested in, in something pretty early. Normally you have to hold it and see the business succeed, but here you can, you know, in tokens introduced a mechanism to liquefy it. And so there was an influx of investors who were A and experienced with you know venture and you know didn't quite have the diligence skill set. This is why you know venture is kind of an institutional asset class is that you have to, you know, uh, you know do do a lot of work and understand what it is you're deploying capital into. And so you know, lots of people rushed into, you know, technology stories that they thought were exciting, that, you know, they looked at the landing page and there were some faces of advisors that looked kind of famous and there was kind of some sort of plausible story about, you know, Bitcoin and then credit cards and payments and, you know, kind of saving the world. And to, you know, to a lot of people that kind of 
made sense. They they joined, you know, the Twitter feeds, the Discord groups. They saw kind of social proof that others were, you know, excited about this project and they poured money in. And so you had, you know, th- this kind of happened during a very short period of time. And so early successful offerings, you know, in, in, in projects like Civic, like like Storage, showed that this is a great way to, you know, for 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 early technology companies to raise capital. And it also demonstrated to to in public investors that hey, these tokens could really appreciate in value disproportionately. And so then looking at from the other side, certainly some of these projects had merit, you know, merit and technology that they were developing. Others were, you know, more of a pipe dream, right? So there was looking at it clearly, there was certainly a lot of graft, a lot of promises that were, you know, technically not feasible. It became, you know, too easy to do this. So you had all these ICOs come to market that, you know, were nothing more than ideas. You had many bad actors that saw this opportunity for graft. This is the reason that, you know, we have regulations in, you know, the the way we do in the U.S. in the first place to protect investors, right? So normally you have disclosure requirements like a prospectus. You have a regulatory body that vets these documents, None of that was present here. We had white papers, we had yellow papers, we had very light disclosures. So people didn't really understand what they were investing in. There was, there was no financial disclosure. There was no clear commitment as to how the funds would be spent. And so it was really a case study of you know why you know modern securities laws exist and that, that why they were written in such a way in the 30s because we saw a lot of this, the good and the bad play out in in the ICO cycle. So I think those are kind of the takeaways, the good and the bad, from my perspective. That makes sense. And the point about going through every financial crisis very quickly in the crypto space is, is quite interesting because, you know, it was followed up by a lot of failures of human nature in the following years that we, I think, have finally just cleared out. But there's no getting away from the types of things that people do and the ways in which they abuse financial systems. And I think one of the key promises of the space is to try and take the discretion that people would have over financial you know, agency. So the principal agent problem in custody, where somebody else is, is literally holding your money or removing gatekeepers who are creating friction in, in the best case or looking are you know, are corrupted and looking for bribes in other cases. And find software solutions or mathematical solutions that are more open and fair. Yeah. Let's move on to the next part of your career with Tenti Holdings and Ten Squared Capital. How did you follow up that ICO era in terms of your interests and what did you focus on and what did you see as the next big opportunity? As we kind of came out of that cycle, I ended up focusing on the investment side of the business and thinking about you know, as institutional investors and allocators come into this space, what is the type of the uh, of, of exposure from an investment perspective that they would want? And then, as I talk to many of the founders in the digital asset space about you know their their concerns and capital needs, one area that I that I, I found was of particular concern is you know wh- where's the growth stage capital going to come from? There were lots of firms that were focused on token investing, seed, pre seed, and Series A. But there were not a lot of people who were tooled up to write larger checks as these companies became bigger over the next few years. And so that, in, in my mind, was kind of a coincidence of wants that you have allocators that want to invest in, you know, more mature blue, you know, blue chip companies in the space. And they want the exposure to the technology and not necessarily to, you know, the digital assets or the volatility of the digital assets directly. And then on the other hand, you had fantastic companies that were, you know, growing user bases quickly, that were expanding, that were hiring, that were going to need growth capital. And so that was kind of the the genesis of the idea for, for 10T, which is building a you know a professional growth stage focused fund that offers allocators this type of exposure in a traditional private equity style, you know, 10 year fund. And that ended up being very successful. It's a it's a fund that grew very quickly over three years. You know, twenty six portfolio companies, some of the best names in in the space that you know everybody's familiar with, from from Kraken to Ledger to Quicknow to Gemini to Figure, and and really kind of that generation and cohort of companies that matured during the you know the twenty one twenty two cycle. 
And then most recently, I started a new fund called 10 Squared, and we are focused on a similar thesis, but more squarely kind of on this idea of an inflection point of where you are past product market fit, where there's clearly a demand for your product, and you're just at a point where you're figuring out that the unit economics of your business work, that margin expansion is coming, and so you're able to start scaling the business very efficiently, right? And so... You know, to me, that's, you know, in, in, in venture terms, that summer, that's somewhere between late Series A and early Series C. In terms of dollars, that's kind of between, you know, $200 million to roughly a billion in terms of valuation. And so to me, that's kind of a sweet spot for where you want to invest in these infrastructure companies, just as they're, you know, they've built out the product, the technology is, you know, proven their customers that are using the platforms and the tech. And they're starting to kind of get to this escape velocity of scaling their businesses, hiring out sales forces, and really taking scaling risk versus taking much earlier stage technology risk or taking you know liquid asset risk. So, so that's kind of our, our, our thesis that's resonating with investors. And I think it's a little bit of a unique approach in, in the digital asset market. When you look at these later stage companies across both vehicles, and I guess just to start with in 21 and 22, I'm curious how hard or how easy it was to identify good investment opportunities. Because on the one hand, especially if you come at it from a fintech point of view, you can say there's really only a handful of companies that could be eligible for a large growth stage private equity type check where you know it's not crazy volatility, their economics seem to be scaling, like they seem to be making sense and acting in a grown-up way, you know, there's there's really kind of a handful of, of companies that would fit that criteria at a large enough size. But then at the same time, during that 21-22 period, you also had massive multiple expansion to levels that we're likely never to see again, you know, 50, 100, 200 times revenue for, for some of the tier one crypto players. How easy or difficult was it for you to identify these players, to get on the cap table, to get to valuations that were reasonable? Yeah, so, so those are very like, you know, important three dimensions. So, so it, it's not, I would say it's not difficult identif- to identify. You know, sourcing to us is a process, and the advantage of investing slightly later stages that you see them coming, right? You usually you know, start talking to founders early, you you look at the Series A data room, you understand where the business is going, you understand the greater context. And so you, you know, by kind of Series B, you have a pretty clear market map and you understand who's who's leading and you have relationships with founders. And so I, I'd say it's, it's not particularly difficult to identify, especially in our space, which is finite and is global, right? So, so you know, I have a universe of roughly... 150 companies that that we track and maybe 90 of those are you know fitting of our criteria and investable and a, a much smaller subset is in a place where they, they need capital and fit the rest of our investment criteria so I, I you know sourcing and identifying opportunities at the growth stage is, is not the difficult part the the hard part is is, is exactly what what you highlighted which is which is price discipline right and and so you have in particular, in 21, you had a lot of capital flow into, into the digital asset space. It wasn't just us who are native investors to the space. You had, you had Tiger, you had Kochu, you had larger hedge funds come in and you know look, look at our space as an opportunity to you know to deploy a lot of capital. And so you had this this massive multiple expansion as you as you alluded to in in some of the best names right and so as we think about fantastic companies like fireblocks or chain analysis or like alchemy they were growing quickly they were providing necessary services they had you know sticky revenue they had this kind of SaaS dynamic and so I, they attracted this 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 capital that was projecting exponential growth and they you know these deals were done at you know 50 80 100 times revenue right and so you know, I, I look at the space as a cash flow driven underwriter. I have I'm sort of steeped in cram and dot value mentality, and so paying these multiples has always been a challenge. And that's why the the way to think about those opportunities is is, is to find sort of an you know to 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 like wage asymmetric warfare <laughs> is to find ways to get into this in, step into the stock without competing with a tiger or co two. And so a lot of what 
we ended up doing was was doing kind of interesting transactions where we purchase stock from another fund or we work with founders or we found an SBV or a special situation. And so creative deal deal making is one way of kind of mitigating these you know, issues of valuation and a way to maintain price discipline. And so that was the hard part is investing at, at a price that you you thought made sense. Uh, and this is especially true for 21 and early 22. As you look onto the market today with your current inflection point strategy, what do you see? What does the field of players look like? So we have a, you know, what I think is a fantastic crop of new companies that are maturing into kind of this this later stage fairway. This year, 23 has been quiet for the most part as, as folks understood that there's probably a dearth of capital available for the space in the market. But over the last, I'd say six weeks, we started seeing you know very exciting companies we've been tracking for a while start to come to market and talk about you know primary fundraisers. So I'm very excited about Q1 and Q2 of 2024. The other piece of the of the market we didn't really talk about, but there's you know there's a big secondaries market that's developed. You know for all those great companies from the last cycle, there's you know a big a large chunk of stock available in the secondary market at meaningful discounts. And so that also presents an opportunity to step into companies that have been on my shopping list for a very long time at what are becoming fairly attractive valuations. Can you give a sense of some of the sectors or some of the types of companies that you're most excited about? You know, our, our taxonomy of the space is is these five verticals that we really care about. You know, the first is infrastructure and developer tools. Then we look at you know, what we called functional networks that kind of became popularly known now as DPINs, which is decentralized physical infrastructure and smart contracts. We spent a lot of time thinking about consumer applications, data analytics, and then lastly, financial services and tokenization. And so, you know, if we think about infrastructure, it's it's companies like Fireblocks, it's companies like Tatum, Figment, some of the well-known names that have you know, it, it established themselves and have a strong track record of operating performance through throughout the last two cycles. On the deep end and functional network side, obviously, you know, Helium's been you know a kind of a fantastical story, and we've been Helium investors for a long time. But there are other great companies in that space, like like Demo, that are emerging. On the smart contract side, you know, big players like Uniswap, like Immutable, Alluvial, Otoy Render. So really interesting space that's just just kind of you know becoming top of mind now. On the consumer application side, so so we're big investors in Animoca, and Animoca is kind of this conglomerate that gives you exposure to many many different parts of the consumer facing NFT and Web three space. So that's you know everything from exchanges like like OpenSea and Blur to gaming, to you know, gaming technology and, and, and engines and tokenization mechanisms. And so, you know, Animoca is a great name. We, we'd love to own at the right price. Great companies like Rarible, which have a unique part of the NFT space. Yuga Labs, another great name that I think is available in the market at, you know, a, a great valuation. So on the consumer application side, you know, our, our view is this, this is how a billion wallets will be built, how a billion consumers transition to the space. It's through something that feels very native and is very, you know, frankly, abstracted from the blockchain that, that feels very organic. So we're focused on, on this vertical. On the analytics side, these are companies that are building the necessary tooling, right? So that's, you know, the TRM, Nance and Dune, Chainalysis, Umber Data, Coin metrics, space and time, companies that are building kind of the core infrastructures that will be used by, you know, the thousands of enterprises that will have to touch digital assets in the future. And then lastly, on the financial services side, you know, this is probably the more mature part of the digital asset space because trading has been the big use case. But companies that are building infrastructure, you know, like Circle, like Anchorage, like Talos, you know, are going to be important and going to be, and are going to be around for a while. And so those are the big names or many companies that are kind of coming up, whether that's Zero Hash or PolySign or Paradigm or Ramp, many names that we see in the emerging growth stage that we think are promising and have managed to build beachheads in meaningful markets. So we're excited about these five verticals and the opportunities we see them and investing in equity of these growing kind of emerging growth, as we call them, businesses. 
you mentioned a number of very interesting companies that are also sitting in pretty defensible positions in their industries. You know, I remember our conversation with Zero Hash, and that's one fascinating business. I want to double click on two themes before we wrap, just to get any more color that you have. I'm curious about the return of STO, security tokens, enterprise blockchain, real world assets tokenization. It is now again quite popular to talk about traditional finance coming on chain and private credit and treasuries and so on. And I'm curious whether that's a in your view, like a bear market phenomenon is just the only thing available to builders or whether something's going to be different this time around? Maybe let's take that as a question. Yeah, that's a great question. I, I spent a lot of time thinking about this because, you know, real world assets has, you know, become such a, you know, a talked about theme. But the, the question to me, and this was kind of the question in, in 17, 18, when we were talking about security tokens is, is there really product market fit? Is, is, is you know, are, are there investors that are looking for securities in, to- in, in tokenized forms, right? Does anybody want to own real estate in the form of tokens rather than, an, you know, an, an LLC agreement that was faxed to them, right? And so I think we're, we're still kind of in that moment in the market where we're trying to figure out if there's a, a real need for assets other than the U.S. dollar, which is you know tokenized through Tether and USDC, and other than the treasuries, which is being pioneered by you know folks like Ondo, like and and that's kind of a, a reach for yield use case. Is is there a need for for tokenized assets? You know, f- from a demand perspective, do investors really want this? There, there are clear reasons why they should want this. You want you want instant settlement. You want assets that are fungible and instantly leverageable. You you want things dynamic. You want in property rights. You want self sovereignty, but do traditional securities investors want that? Do family offices want that? Do institutions want to hold, you know, tokenized securities rather than, you know, the, the way they hold them now with, with a QSIP? And so we're excited about the space. As we think about the investable companies to express this thesis, I mean, I think we've had some players that have been around for a while, companies like Securitize that have been focused on advancing this market. We can think about T0 that built the ATS infrastructure to do this. But I think you know may, maybe the the best way to express this view now is just to look at the leaders that are already succeeding companies like Circle that are solving the use case that's demanded, which is you know tokenizing dollars and and creating similar digital asset currency, you know, asset currencies in, in other currencies in, in in euros, yen, etc. It's amazing how the new things are the old things, and the old things are the new things. And already we have the euphoria, at least in some places like Solana, with the Bonk meme coin and on Bitcoin with ordinals. And again, it's starting to feel like the beginning of 2019. So I'm sure we're going to continue to go in and out of these cycles. And you know, I'm super impressed by the way you've been able to navigate them and build interesting businesses. If our listeners want to learn more about you or about your company, where should they go? 10square.com. We share a lot of research. We do kind of fundamental bottom-up research pieces. So check out the website, read, read our views on the space and learn more. Fantastic. Stan, thank you so much for joining me today. Lex, it's a great pleasure. Thank you. Hi, everyone. That's it for this week's episode of the FinTech Blueprint. For more technical deep dives into all things fintech and decentralized finance, check out fintechblueprint.com and grab a free subscription to the newsletter. This is Lex, and I'll see you next time.